Next, I turn to a comprehensive syllabus. The term syllabus is applied to several kinds of guides for courses or programs. Some are in outline form without extended comments or explanations. Others, like the one I prepared in 1949, are in the form of expository discourse. Whatever the form, a syllabus sufficiently complete to guide student learning might well include one, a statement of the reasons for offering the course or program, for example, for whom it is intended, what values it is likely to have for these students, and how it is related to other courses or programs. Two, what the educational objectives are, that is, what students will be helped to learn. Three, for each division or unit of the course or program, a statement or a listing of the learning tasks that are available to them. Four, a suggestion of the time probably required to perform the learning tasks successfully. Five, the means that will be used to evaluate students' performance and help in feedback. Whatever else is necessary, six, for the particular course or program to guide students in utilizing effectively the resources available for their learning. In brief, a syllabus should serve as a published guide to help students in selecting a course or program and in carrying on successfully the educational activities. The preparation of such a syllabus helps the instructional staff to identify unsettled issues regarding purposes and means and requires thoughtful consideration and operational decisions to clarify learning goals and establish the student learning system. As I reviewed the earlier syllabus, I found no reason to change the basic questions it raises. What should be the educational objectives of the curriculum? What learning experiences should be developed to enable the students to obtain the objectives? What should the learning experience, how should the learning experiences be organized to increase their cumulative effect? How should the effectiveness of the curriculum be evaluated? These are still basic and their importance has been reaffirmed by the experience of the past quarter of a century. However, some change of emphases are necessary and I want to comment on two of them. I would give much greater emphasis now to careful consideration of the implications for curriculum development of the active role of the student in the learning process. I would also give much greater emphasis to a comprehensive examination of the non-school areas of student learning in developing a curriculum. In the massive curriculum projects of the 1960s in the United States, the objectives were usually selected by subject matter specialists with little attention given to the needs and interests of the learners. Mention was most often made of the educational delivery system, as though education could be delivered to students rather than their having to acquire it through their active learning. Educational technology was commonly treated as though it was the robot teacher rather than furnishing certain tools that teachers could employ, as, for example, presenting material that could be used as part of a learning experience. Some of the projects actually sought to develop teacher-proof materials. These terms and the attitudes they represent indicate that some leading curriculum builders are overlooking the fact that learning is a process in which the learner plays an active, not a passive role. It is the behavior that the learner carries on with consistency that can become part of his repertoire of behavior and in this way will have been learned. A human being cannot be forced to learn intellectual and emotional behavior. Only under coercion or when offered tempting rewards will he even attempt a learning task which seems to him meaningless or distasteful. And even then, if his experience with the task is not rewarding to him, he will not continue the behavior and it is not really learned. Furthermore, the behavior becomes a permanent part of his repertoire only if he continues to carry it on. This means that the learner must see the way in which the things he learns can be used, and he must have the opportunity to continue to employ the learned behavior in the various situations he encounters. These conditions for learning have important implications to consider in selecting educational objectives. The curriculum Objectives selected should not only be, one, important things for the students to learn in order to participate constructively in contemporary society, two, sound in terms of the subject matter involved, and three, in accord with the educational philosophy of the institution, but also they should be of interest or be meaningful to the prospective learners or capable of being made so in the process of instruction. This criterion is mentioned and briefly developed in the earlier book but it is being overlooked 
even by some whose curriculum development rationale appears to be similar. This does not imply that the interests of learners and their understanding of the meaningfulness of educational objectives at any given time are permanent and do not change. Quite the contrary. In a particular unit of study, although the initial objectives should be those that the student at that time sees are interesting and or meaningful things for him to learn, as he goes through the learning experiences, he will broaden and deepen his interests. As he gains greater understanding of the relevance of what he was learning, he will see the meaning of and develop interest in objectives that stimulate him to further study. For example, a child who has not had parents read to him and who has not seen others enjoy reading is not likely to participate actively in decoding exercises in a primary reading program, nor is he likely to see that they have any meaning for him. For such a child, the appropriate initial objectives in reading may be those that help him find fun in material that is read to him, and then, he, and then he will want to read some of these materials himself. The objectives then can reflect these new interests the student has acquired.